Thank you for that speech, uh, Minister. It's, um, uh, I, I think, perhaps best for us to start talking about some of these tectonic shifts that uh, you have identified uh, and the Prime Minister identified yesterday. Mm. Um, uh, you know, we do indeed live in changeable times. What, what for you, are some of the uh, most significant um, shifts that we should be thinking about in, in our current context? I think it's the reality that uh, the world that we all grew up in is no more. Uh, and that is, to put it very bluntly, uh, economically and security-wise, uh, the post-World War II economic and security institutions that have defined our world and our lives uh, are not what they were. And that is profoundly... Um, is impacting where we've gone with, this, with these documents and with this thinking over the last 12 months. Uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but the fact is our world is very different and we have to define a new uh, rules-based order uh, and encourage very strongly uh, all major state actors to accord with these rules and most importantly to respect sovereignty. Do you think there is a prospect that we can kind of reverse this um, these accelerating negative trends. Um, it, it's once the rules-based order starts to fray, it's it's a very difficult creature to sort of knit back together. Uh, yes, I do. But again, no one country can do it on their own. And so, part of this document is an acknowledgement that we need to do more of our our own heavy lifting, mm. and we need to encourage others in our region to do more of their own heavy lifting, and not just to rely on a single nation to to do that for them. Uh, one of the things uh, that has uh, most struck me in this job is that I knew that defence diplomacy was important before I took this role, but it is very clear to me now just how critically important our relationships are, uh, not just uh, in our near region, uh, across the Indo-Pacific, but globally. Uh, just to give you an idea uh, of that, uh, in the first few months uh, I was Minister, I'd made 16 visits to international counterparts. Uh, I welcome six here and I've had well over 30 uh, via uh, video mm. and uh, virtually since, since then. Uh, it's the first time that... So it's not just us that are worried. As I said in my speech and the Prime Minister has said that it's not just us worried by the behaviours that we're now seeing in our region. Uh, other regional friends are now coming out more consistently. But really significantly, if you have a look at last week, uh, the Secretary General of NATO came out and very strongly indicated an acknowledgement that what happens in our region now matters to NATO a lot, uh, and as did the President of the EU. Mm -hmm. So that, that is shifting. We have to find a new way of, of working together. So whether it's a, I look akin to a network of uh, interrelationships with people who value what we value. Reading um, the, the, the strategic update, is, is there just a, a hint in between the lines that the United States is perhaps less reliable than it once was as a, no. as a partner for dealing with regional security threats? No. Uh, again, the document is very clear, and I've been very clear, that the United States is still the bedrock of peace and prosperity in our region, and it has been uh, probably since World War II. But again, as I've said, no one nation could or should shoulder the majority of the responsibility for the rest of us. So in, in my time, uh, and I'm sure um, that the CDF and the Secretary uh, would acknowledge or agree with, our relationship with the United States, military to military, I think has never been stronger. Certainly at my level with Mark Esper um, and with the Secretary and CDF's level, we have record levels of interoperability. Our training is becoming more sophisticated. The operations we, we do together uh, is, is almost seamless. Well, let's talk uh, about some of the fun equipment uh, decisions. Um, El Razm, long range anti ship missile. Mm -hmm. uh, why El Razm? Why now? What, what can this do that's particularly relevant to Defence Force capabilities? Well, as, as I said in, in, my, in the speech yes, yesterday and today, we have made a very conscious decision uh, for long-range strike missiles uh, for all three services because the, for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, with the increased militarisation in our region and the increasing accessibility and, of weapons uh, and how they're technologically developing. 
uh, they are now a threat. They are a threat to our deployed personnel. So we have decided to, this is the first acquisition for the Air Force that we're getting from the US Navy. Uh, they will, we're starting training on them next year mm -hmm. and we'll be at IOC by 2023. So this is the first uh, to be on the Super Hornets. We'll roll them out to the JSF and have a look at uh, what other acquisitions we do. But they are to defend our people, but also in acknowledgement that as, as we know, uh, launch platforms are coming closer and closer to, to Australia as well. So we have to understand the technology. And these are a very, very powerful deterrent. Mm. And uh, long range strike for land forces. I've had a few people ask me questions about what that means. Yes. Um, perhaps you or CDF, uh, what, what, what's in your mind for, for those uh, capabilities? Yeah. Uh, sure, Peter, thanks. That means that we need to study it very carefully. Mm. And it uh, needs to be looked at within the suite of capabilities that a Defence Force has. Uh, but it's all about reach and uh, uh, either establishing or re-establishing uh, that reach. So we, we will be uh, studying it uh, over the next couple of years to make recommendations to the Minister and Government. So this is deployable capability, um, CDF. It's not about lining the beaches around the coastline or anything like that. Uh, that's, that's right. Yeah. But, uh, let, let's have a look at it. It's not, yes. So CDF, let me ask you a different question. I, I actually was uh, emailed by Tess Newton Kane, mm -hmm. who wanted me to ask you about what <coughs> does uh, this uh, policy document do for climate change? Uh, the Bowie Declaration in the Pacific identifies climate change as the biggest strategic threat uh, in the region. Um, and then I think it, um, very much connected to that is a sense of uh, what the document uh, talks about in terms of ADF assistance to uh, wider civil authority, both domestically in Australia for disaster response, but also for um, international uh, um, HADR as well. Uh, sure. A really strong thread that connects uh, this work with the 2016 uh, white paper uh, speaks to engagement, to partnership, to building communities of security in our region and uh, a deep Australian commitment to doing so and to being part of a community of nations. Uh, that is something that we have been doing uh, very strongly in the Pacific with a step up over recent years, but something that we did uh, and have done since the first humanitarian assistance disaster relief mission to Samoa and Tonga, mm -hmm. 1919, 101 years ago. The Royal Australian Navy uh, went to assist uh, with an outbreak of Spanish influenza. Right. So we've been in the region for more than 100 years and, and we are there as a member of a neighbourhood and continue to be so. Uh, the longer term issues for Australia and Australian national policy, defence being a part of that policy with regard to climate change, they will proceed nationally. What we can do in terms of the immediate opportunities that the four structure plan presents to us is see those capabilities that have a dual, a natural dual use opportunity, whether they're rotary wing, the air mobility uh, opportunities beyond the C-130J, uh, army watercraft, and the engineering effects that we and the Pacific and Southeast Asia have in combination, all these have and are and will continue to be used uh, in response to the mitigating issues uh, that might arise, uh, where, wherever they arise, whether it's domestic or regional. General, thank you. Secretary, a um, uh, uh, billion dollars here, a billion dollars there. Pretty soon you're talking a lot of money and 570-odd uh, million for the decade for, for defence as a whole, 270 million for capability. Um, is this all affordable in terms of what the, the document has set out within that envelope of uh, funding? Yeah. Peter, f for the department, it's very important uh, and we very much appreciate the government's commitment to that, that ex uh, very 10, ten years of, of a funding profile that allows us the, to do the planning that we need to do to bring these capabilities into being. It, it'll also allow us to give certainty to Australian business so that we can work with our business partners and the government has now decided, uh, as you know, that defence industry is a fundamental input to capability and that's how we intend to approach our relationship with Australian business. So it allows us to uh, build those relationships, let business know what capabilities want so that they can make the business decisions they need, the investment decisions to build sovereign capability for Australia. But as you know, that funding profile is set 
And within that, we must deliver the capabilities that the government has directed us to. That means if there are pressures, we will need to do one of several things. We will need to go back to government and say, because of either the need for sovereign capability or because of complexity, because of workforce, we need to slow that down, mm. push things to the right to allow us to deliver that capability for you. We can de-scope. We can uh, ruthlessly prioritise to prioritise what is important for government and to uh, push off other capabilities. And that's what the integrated investment program allows us to do. It allows us to come to government with options and say we need these sovereign capabilities, we need to develop our workforce, we want to build Australian industry, we can do it in this time or we can't do it all within the funding envelope that you've given us. These are the options for, for, for us, for government to take about what it decides to pr prioritise and what it decides not to. So, and the prioritisation process is what has happened here where we've done some work, government has taken decisions about what its priorities are over the next 10 years and we will now need to implement those priorities. And Peter, from the government's perspective, that's why in these documents there is a lot of effort in transparency and also in the numbers <coughs> because, uh, as the Secretary has said, we're going to have to continue to keep making hard decisions about uh, what, what we trade off, what we have to trade off, what we de-scope de or what we discontinue. So we've been very transparent in these documents. Uh, so Australians need to know how we're spending their money. Yeah. I mean, there, there are no easy choices no, left not. in terms of what can be de-scoped. Um, and there are a lot of... Uh, really necessary choices to be made in terms of things to be added to the strength of the defence force as we go mm. forward. So this is going to be a really tough, tough. game to play, it seems to me. Mm. Um, speaking of tough questions, uh, Minister, it is all about China, isn't it? Uh, this is not about any single country, Peter, but it really is about our deteriorating geostrategic circumstances. Uh, look, in relation to China, as I've said in my speech, we welcome uh, their economic development. We, rec we welcome them as a responsible regional partner, but where behaviours are not consistent with the standards not only do we expect of ourselves, but we also expect of all other regional nations in terms of sovereign respect, in terms of, as you said, adherence to rules-based order, then we are calling that behaviour out. I want to, uh, perhaps if I can, quickly get all, yeah. all of you to um, offer some thoughts on Southeast Asia. You've all had deep experience of the region. Greg was ambassador in Jakarta. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it seems to me that very much part of this document is the thought that um, we, we are going to be lifting our engagement with the region quite dramatically. Um, we don't call it this, but it, it's a sort of Southeast Asian equivalent of the Pacific step up. We know that we, we have to do more. Mm -hmm. what, what's your thoughts on that? Um, perhaps Angus, what does that mean in terms of um, ADF um, engagement? And, and Greg, maybe you could offer a few thoughts on Indonesia in particular. So very significant uh, region, like perhaps the significant region for our future and uh, a region in which we have a very long and strong history of ties, an ASEAN partner nation now for 46 years. Uh, I think you'll see uh, deeper connections at the personal level, uh, at the level of exercise and development of interoperability, and a strengthening of understanding between the two countries at many levels, but in the, in the military sense, uh, a, a coming together of like mind on a range of security issues. And it's very promising. I've spoken to many of my uh, colleagues in the region uh, over the last uh, few weeks and have been doing so throughout the COVID-19 experience. And uh, we've got very strong relationships and they're just going to continue to grow. Uh, the Defence Cooperation pro Program is probably one of the most important uh, programs our nation has to engage with uh, our friends and our partners in the region. Uh, it, is, it, is almost, it is pretty much the jewel in the crown. Uh, our defence uh, personnel who are de deployed in these positions right across, right across the region have great relationships, great friendships uh, with their counterparts. And my relationships with many of my regional counterparts, again, is critically important. Mm. Uh, people like Australians, they want, to, they want to trade with us, they want to have defence relationships with us. 
uh, and increasingly so in countries that we haven't traditionally had a stronger defence relationship as perhaps we should have, and most recently with India, with the, the CSP that's signed. Uh, we have had an exponential increase in military to military activities over the last four years with India, and that's continuing to grow. I'm now an interlocutor for India with Indonesia uh, to, to start up a new trilateral um, maritime uh, exercise series. So there's a lot of these minilaterals, multilaterals, and I think that's really the key for the future is how we bring all of those together uh, to support each other economically and also in terms of peace and prosperity and shaping the world we want to live in in the Indo-Pacific. I will ask Greg about Indonesia, mm -hmm. but uh, are you able to share with us in any any of the comments that you might have had from your colleagues uh, reacting to the, uh, the strategic update? Uh, I've had uh, many comments. Uh, some of them have been made publicly in their own nations and some of them privately to me. But I think it's safe to say that uh, so far the response from regional partners has been incredibly strong, very, very strongly supportive. Thank you. And uh, Secretary in Indonesia? Sorry, Peter. But first of all, but the Indo-Pacific is core strategic geography for Australia and that's why I think it's very appropriate that the government has identified the Indo-Pacific as the region in which we will uh, focus our, our defence planning and, and build up our defence diplomacy and engagement. And in that, of course, Indonesia is a vital partner for us. I've been very, very pleased to see the way in which our defence engagement has, has strengthened over the last couple of years. Uh, a lot of that has to do with sort of the changing environment, the way in which uh, we, uh, we are having more strategic perceptions in common with mm. Indonesia. But Indonesia, uh, the prosperity of Indonesia, its unity, its strength is vitally important for us, but it's also vitally important for ASEAN because a strong and prosperous Indonesia means a strong and prosperous ASEAN. With, when Indonesia was going through a lot of internal turmoil uh, many years ago after the Asian financial crisis, I think it was, it was very evident that ASEAN lacked that sort of unity of purpose. And uh, when, when, when Indonesia is the largest member of, of ASEAN, when it has the confidence to bring that together, uh, I think ASEAN is a stronger grouping when Indonesia feels confident about its place and, in the And Indonesia was one of the first uh, ASEAN countries to come out today very strongly uh, backing our policy. Thank you. Um, CDF, I did want to ask you a question about the, the grey zone, which sure. is now a much larger part of the uh, mm -hmm. uh, sort of strategic lexicon of, of Australian defence thinking. Uh, and a, a number of people here, I'm sure, would recall about a year ago, uh, the General gave a speech to an, an ASPE function about political warfare, which is really the same thing under a, a slightly different name. What, what is your sense of the, the role that the ADF can play in this grey zone challenge, which almost by definition is um, areas that is actually short of military conflict? Uh, Peter, we see in the force structure plan enhancements to things like intelligence, surveillance, uh, reconnaissance capability, uh, and also to cyber capabilities of various forms. Uh, those can give us awareness and give us opportunity in particular domains. But I would offer that much more importantly, if you want to both defend yourself and on occasions where your interests are engaged, seek to prosecute action in that ambiguous grey zone, you need to think like those who are becoming accustomed to employing grey zone tactics. Mm. Typically, that means thinking across all of the elements of national power mm. that might be at play and not necessarily responding like for like, but asking the question, how can cost be, on be imposed on actions that are in breach of the rules-based order, uh, violate international law, or are in some way uh, diminishing or destabilising of regional security? Mm -hmm. So it, it's a first start with a very dynamic sense of how to think about the problem, mm. look at all of the choices and options you have and the subtlety that might be required and the patience that will be required. And then ask the question uh, with any particular element or object within the Defence Force or any, any, any other part of a government instrumentality, what can we do with it yeah. in, in the tactics applied, in the procedures employed? 
Uh, I think we have to think grey if we're to, to effectively respond to grey in the ways that are suitable for us and appropriate for the nature of our democracy and our values. One of, the, one of the most effective ways that we're doing that is taking uh, the information that we have and sharing it, you know, the old sunlight, and sharing it with uh, regional friends who don't have the same capabilities we do and actually showing them what's happening. Yeah. And they can take their own actions, but that is incredibly important. Yes. Thank you. And appreciated. Let's take a, a couple of questions from the audience. Um, I'll ask you to put your hand up and, and um, a person will come with a sanitised microphone for you. <laughs> and um, let's... Uh, I'm going to go to uh, uh, Kim uh, and then Michael at the back. So uh, just behind, back row, Kim Bergman. And then we'll go to you, Michael. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Kim Bergman from Asia Pacific Defence Reporter. Um, COVID-19, I'm interested in, well, the Minister's assessment, but perhaps others, why you see it as a strategic risk? Because once countries succeed in containing the virus and we all get used to washing our hands more frequently, won't life then return pretty much to as it was six months ago? Well, Kim, I think we'd all like to share your optimistic assessment <laughs> of the situation, but I think, uh, sadly, that that's not the case. Uh, those of you would have heard the Prime Minister yesterday, he very uh, deliberately made references and analogies to the 1930s. And he did that uh, for a number of reasons. But the main one is that there are, there are a lot of parallels. In the uh, 19, early 1930s, it was a post-pandemic world, uh, which had been severely impacted uh, by the pandemic. It was going through economic uncertainty. Uh, Rules-based order was uh, certainly deteriorating and there were great technological advances, uh, particularly in aviation. So when you get a combination like that of circumstances, we hope, we hope that you're right. But uh, there is no vaccine on the horizon yet. And as we know, there are certain uh, actors who are making hay uh, during this economic instability uh, during the pandemic. Uh, I saw one uh, uh, very credible report the other day suggesting perhaps 300,000 deaths in the US by the time of the mm. presidential election. Uh, Michael. Minister, uh, you're now managing things on two very different time frames. You know, the first one is delivering those big long-term capability programs mm. well over decades. But the second is the new urgency in the update particularly around accelerated acquisition of advanced weapons and closing gaps in sustaining ADF um, military operations. And you spoke yesterday about accountability and reform. How are you going to use accountability and reform to drive this urgency and this rapid implementation that clearly you and the Prime Minister expect? Uh, well, Michael, that's a very good question, that one that goes fundamentally to the heart of what I do and what uh, Melissa does. There's a number of parts to that. The first one is what we have in this documentation. You can't hold anyone to account for anything if you can't measure it, and that you can't actually hold someone accountable for deliverables. So that these documents are the first step in that. Uh, in the document itself, we've got 10 years, as you know, the 10 years funding certainty. Where we've actually gone into contract, we've got actual numbers, uh, and they will not change. Uh, and if they do, that's what I've said, you hold me and you hold uh, these two gentlemen to account for that in, in a more transparent way. We've also, in the handouts that you'll see that go with the, the two documents, uh, we have unpacked the Naval Shipbuilding Plan in a different time frame, so that very clearly you can now see, because there was some conflation between constant and outturn dollars and time frames, whereas now what we've got is for those longer term, in, in this case the shipbuilding program, it is very, very clear uh, how much of that money. So that's a, a, a bracket of uh, funding over the, into the late 2050s. Uh, is uh, 163 to sort of the late 170s, but again, over that time frame. So we're getting much better in defence uh, through the first principles review. We've had a much more strategic centre and we are providing more uh, capability as a smarter customer within CASG, not only to reform their own processes and their own transparency, as you can see uh, under the great leadership uh, of Tony. So it is, a, it is a journey, but in terms of how we, we uh, go into contract, how we manage contracts, how we project management, and from my end, the political end, how do we make that transparent and accountable? And if we do have changes, how do we make that clearer why we have made the decisions to change 
uh, as we've done in this document. Because as you'll see, there are a lot of uh, changes uh, to the original IIP. So it, it comes down to, I think, Project Management 101. It comes down to transparency and greater reporting, but also being very clear about your timeframes. And you're right, we're still going through uh, the smart buyer process and how we do rapid acquisitions, how we do spiral mm. uh, acquisitions and project development. So it's a journey, but we are absolutely on, on the pathway. Thank you. Now we'll have a quick strategic question from Professor Paul Dibb, and I'll finish with uh, Catherine uh, Zeising, if that's OK, Minister, after that. So, Paul. Minister, given the importance of long-range strike missiles, which I endorse, by the way, to be able to attack an adversary, including the adversary's infrastructure, mm -hmm. what are the prospects for local manufacture, given that what that would mean for greater self-reliance yep. and sovereignty, particularly preparing for high intensity conflict? Mm. Well, there's two aspects to that, Paul. One is in relation to this particular capability to the El Razm. Uh, we are acquiring them from the United States Navy because that is where the capability and that very high-end uh, technology rests. Like with many other programs, wherever we can, we are now looking at how do we bring that IP and also uh, that the build and sustainment and maintenance uh, here to Australia. We've done a very, very good job over the last, for more than the term of uh, our government, but actually increasing local sustainment, you know, to the point with Collins now, that's over, I think, about 97%. So wherever possible, transferring the IP here where we can. The Joint Strike Fighter is another great example. Obviously, it's a, a foreign military sale. But again, we've got 50 companies uh, in the global supply chain, $1.7 billion worth of uh, industry here in Australia. So in relation to that capability, given we're just at the start of this process, we, ha we are doing this in partnership and we're with the United States Navy in this case, but we will look at that. But again, we have to be realistic about you know, project by project, which ones we have to acquire overseas, whether in partnership, whether we're just getting them you know, like off the shelf, or whether we're actually starting to look to develop the capability here. I mean, sorry, I'd also note yes. that uh, Defence Science and Technology have been working with uh, University of Queensland on uh, hypersonic research for a number of years and uh, we can do science and technology in this country as, as you know, Paul, and uh, I think that there's a bright future for innovative Australian technology companies. Yes. Uh, Catherine, last question to you. Hello, I'm on. Oh, You're on. Yay. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your insights this afternoon. I was um, very glad to hear about transparency and clarity, particularly from the Minister and the Secretary there. In that vein, is the IIP going to be updated publicly since it's been four years now? Well, I'm not sure, Catherine, how much more transparent we can be than we've been in these two documents. I think you've got more information and more certainty in terms of, of the numbers. And as I've said, this is a journey. Yes, we are looking at ways that we can keep uh, more information uh, out there. So yes, we are looking at ways we can do that. But I think what you've got in these two documents is a great start. Well, colleagues, it's been a really fascinating hour. And uh, Minister, CDF, uh, Secretary, I want to thank you for taking the time. Uh, I, I've lived the joy myself of being producing a number of these documents over the years. And um, I really do want to congratulate you for bringing something out which is substantive and timely um, and original in terms of the new directions that it's setting uh, f for the defence organisation and the defence force. That's great for us. It means we'll be in business for a long time, uh, picking away at the strands of, uh, of all of these things, finding the things that we disagree with as well as the things that we agree with. So I'm, I'm looking forward to mining this seam uh, for some little time to come. Uh, but I want to thank you for your openness and for taking the time to uh, be with us today.